Hi friends, welcome to the By Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Hoover, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week this season, I'm talking with a guest about how they are pursuing devotion to God by fighting sin and learning to delight in Him. Through their stories, we are learning how we too can fight for wholehearted allegiance to King Jesus. This episode was sponsored by The Good Book Company, publishers of Born Again This Way. In this powerful and personal book, Rachel Gilson describes her own unexpected journey of coming out and then coming to faith and what came next. As she does so, she addresses many of the questions that Christians living with same-sex attraction are wrestling with, and she argues that it really is possible to live a life that's both faithful and fulfilling. Pick up a copy at thegoodbook.com or wherever good books are sold. This episode was also sponsored by b h Publishers, publisher of Don't Forget to Remember by Ellie Holcomb. I know you aren't all parents, but I am confident every one of you knows a parent of toddlers, preschoolers, or early readers. Ellie Holcomb's new book, Don't Forget to Remember, whimsically reminds us of God's love and care for His people. As she says, and even on days you forget what is true, don't forget to remember God won't forget you. This sweet book is great for baby showers and gifts and is available wherever books are sold. I'm thrilled to get to share today's episode of By Faith with you. My guest today is Vanitha Reisner, and what a joy it was to get to talk with her. Vanitha calls herself a sufferer, and you'll find out why in our conversation today. She has experienced a lot of loss in her life, but as you'll hear in her voice, she has so much joy. She actually connects joy with her suffering, and the way she talks about it in today's episode will give you a fresh perspective on suffering. In this episode, Vanitha shares her story, and we really drill down into bitterness. I ask Vanitha how she's resisted bitterness against certain people in her life and also against God. What she says is definitely going to challenge and encourage you. It definitely did me. Here, friends, is my conversation with Vanitha Reisner. Thanks, Vanitha, for joining me on my podcast. This is so fun. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this, Christine. Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing more of your story. I have gotten to meet you really briefly a couple of years ago, but it was a it was something where I heard just tidbits of your story. But today we're going to get to hear a lot more, which I'm excited yes. about. <laughs> so will you introduce yourself and where you are currently before we go backwards? Yes. I'm Vanita Reisner, and I write a blog called Dance in the Rain. And I've written one book, The Scars That Have Shaped Me, How God Meets Us in Suffering. And now I am writing another book and memoir this time, just about the ways that God has met me in suffering. And that's really mostly what I do is write about suffering, which I know sounds like a huge downer of a topic. And at times it really can be, but it is the way that I have met God. And so I really wouldn't trade anything that has happened in my life because with each hard thing, even though it's been ridiculously hard to make it through, I find God on the other side in a much deeper way. Mm. So that so, is what has motivated me to write. So you don't mind that that has become your primary theme you're writing about and talking about? No, it's funny because I don't consider myself a writer. I consider myself a sufferer who just has been called to write. So that's probably why it doesn't bother me because that's really the only thing I, I know to write mm -hmm. about. Whereas some people are amazingly eloquent writers and they can write about anything. And this is pretty much all I know. So it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard anybody say, I consider myself a sufferer. But that's... Yeah. <laughs> When we get into your story, people are going to understand why you would say that. Right, right. Yeah, there's a lot a lot of suffering, but there's been a lot of joy too. So I have to say, I, I feel like joy and suffering are really tied together. And so I think I've had a lot of joy in my life because of a lot of the losses that I've had. Yeah. Well, can we go back to the, your childhood? Because that's really where the suffering began. You were diagnosed as a child with polio. Yes. And I got polio um, when my family was living in India and I was three months old. And in India, they don't give the polio vaccine until you're six months old. So the doctors had no idea what I had. And so they gave me cortisone. My fever was 105 and it lowered my fever, but 
it cortisone breaks down the body's immune system. And so this virus spread unchallenged through my whole body. And in 24 hours, I was paralyzed. And then the doctors realized that I had polio, but it was too late by then. I was basically a quadriplegic. And the doctors told my parents I would probably die. They said, if she makes it through, she will never even be able to sit up in a wheelchair. And they told my parents if they had wanted any hope for me, they'd need to leave the country and go to England or somewhere else. Because in India, there's a real stigma with disability and people don't want to help people with the disability at all. It looks like a curse on your family. Even, even Christians have that sort of feeling Hmm. and Hindus definitely do. That means that you've done something bad in your Hmm. past life. So they really don't have even services for people with disabilities. They're sort of shoved in the back room. And so they told my parents, if you want medical care and if you really want a life for your daughter, you're going to have to leave. And so my dad, who had a job as a professor, took a manual job installing telephones in London just to get out of the country. Wow. So, and you were yeah, so we left there? Yeah. Yes. So I had my first treatment in England when I was two. And then by the time I was 12, I had had 21 operations. So I just lived in and out of the hospital. And my parents left England when I was... Um, Uh, actually a little after my surgery and moved to Canada. And I had most of my surgeries in Canada and lived in a Shriners hospital. My parents didn't have the money. And so we lived in a, I went to a free hospital, but the problem with that hospital was parents weren't only allowed to visit on weekends. So Mm -hmm. I was there for nine months straight by myself, pretty much. My parents would come in Saturday morning and for a few hours on Sunday. How old were you? I was seven, six and seven, eight. Wow. So I lived on my own basically. And I was really angry at God. I just couldn't believe that this was my life. And my parents were believers and they would talk about faith, but I didn't have any. And I remember the worst part really was not being in the hospital. It was coming home because I was bullied because I walk with a limp and people would I would say every day, somebody would ask me, what's wrong with you? Why do you walk like that? When I was seven, a group group of boys, I was outside by myself and a group of boys ran up to me and they threw stones at me and pushed me down and called me a cripple. And I had just gotten back from the hospital then. And I remember thinking, I hate this life. You know, I thought the hospital was bad. All I could think about was coming home and being with my family And then I realized when I was home, I was also at school and kids were really cruel. Mm. And I just started getting really angry Mm. at everybody, but particularly at God, Mm. because I, I decided actually after a while through the years that God didn't exist. Because if he did, he would never have allowed me to go through that. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how I coped for a decade, I would say. And I'm, I'm imagining that what the doctors in India said didn't actually come true, that you weren't a quadriplegic and, you know, in a wheelchair for, but, or were you, I mean, tell us where you were physically. Yes. Well, that's a great question. I was, because of all the surgeries, I was able to walk when I was seven and then, but I, I've never had any strength in my arms And I've never had surgery on my arms except for my hands because there's not enough muscle to do that. So, but walking, it's kind of amazing, actually, when you talk, when I go see a doctor now and throughout my life, I technically don't have enough muscle to walk. So every single doctor I've ever seen will look at my chart and say, you shouldn't be walking. Like you don't have the muscle to walk. But somehow God in his mercy has allowed me to walk, which is pretty incredible. Let's go to your teenage years because you talked about uh, being bitter and being angry at God and you decided there was no God. This couldn't be. Yes. So tell us about your teenage years. Okay. Well, they were hard. I, in early teenage years, I felt like it was everybody else and me. And I would think in my mind, what do normal people do? Like, how do normal people think? And so there was this big rift between people who had these lives that looked pretty and my life, which looked really hard. But I, in high school, I went to FCA, which is Fellowship of Christian Athletes. The only reason I went was to 
meet guys. So I wasn't a Christian, <laughs> but I wanted to fellowship with the athletes. And I did. And that was great. My friends and I would go, my best friend and I would go and sit in the back and talk about boys because she didn't care about God either. And that was good. But then she went away on a retreat and she came back and she said to me, God is real. And I still remember sitting in her house thinking, oh no, you are going to want to talk to me about God. And I don't want to talk about God. And she did. She always wanted to bring it up. And finally, I went home one day and I just said, God, if you're real, show me. And I was lying in bed when I said that and I rolled over and I thought, you know what? Nothing's going to happen. So I woke up the next day and I thought, you know what? I, I don't think there is a God, but if there is, maybe I should give him a chance. I'm nice and arrogant at 16. <laughs> and I have, um, I had a Bible that I had gotten when I was confirmed at church, never read it, never opened it, but it was on my bedside table. So I pulled it out and I flipped it open and I said, okay, God, you know, if you're real, you know, speak to me. And I flipped it open to Leviticus and, you know, nothing really <laughs> happened. I was like, okay, see, this is what I thought about the Bible. And then I just said to God, God, why? Like, why did all this happen? And I flipped open the Bible to John 9 and I started reading. And um, it was that the um, disciples and Jesus come upon a blind, blind man who was blind from birth. And the disciples ask him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the work of God would be displayed in his life. Mm. And that blew me away. I remember just sitting on my bed thinking, God just answered me. Like God answered my very question of why did this happen to me? And he didn't answer it with a why of what I had done, but a why of what the purpose was. And I feel like we ask that why question all the time. And sometimes we're wondering why because why, what have I done? And I, we still ask it, and I still ask it, but really God answers often with why, what is the purpose? And so I remember just kneeling down by the side of my bed and committing my life to Christ, say, thinking, I don't know you, God, but clearly you know me. And you have, from the beginning of the world, you've done something in my life. Just started reading John 12, actually, um, John 9 through 12 that day and just seeing this bigger picture of God than I'd ever seen before. And that changed me. And so I became a believer and was just really excited thinking that I was going to have the perfect life though. I honestly, truly thought everybody has one hard thing and I've had mine. So I'm good. I'm not going to have any more trouble in my life. And so I. I remember one time talking to some people and thinking, I'm so sad that you have not been through your suffering because I've been through mine and my life is going to be great. And it was, it was great for 10 years. I would say I got everything I wanted and then life started to crumble. Mm. Before we get to that, I'm wondering in that, in those years after you become a, became a believer, how did you look at your physical health and your, the polio and your body and all of that? Did it change the way that you saw yourself? It did. And part of it was because of this friend I made in high school who was a believer. And I remember having a conversation with her about that, just about feeling embarrassed about my body and just thinking like she had wanted me to go to the beach for junior, senior weekend. And I didn't want to go because I didn't want to be in a bathing suit. I just didn't want all of that stuff. And she just said, you know, I know that you've suffered, but everybody has, and your scars are visible, but they show people that you have courage. And she said, I know you don't believe that, but that's how we all see it. But we all have something that's hard in our lives that maybe other people can't see. Mm. And so I would just, she encouraged me to realize that nobody has the perfect life. And my scars really, um, showed all I'd been through, whereas other people's stuff is a lot harder to talk about. And so that gave me a really different perspective than I'd ever had. And it changed the way I felt about my body. Not that I'm ever like super excited about my limp because people still ask me all the time, you know, what's wrong with you? But I've had, I've really have a different perspective on it than I did before mm -hmm. thinking God's going to use this and this is, this is okay. Yeah. That John nine passage really coming true that God yes, will be seen exactly. in, in that. 
so you start building this perfect Christian life. You think it's all going to go up from here. What did that perfect Christian life look like? What did that mean to you? Yeah, well, um, I went to UVA for college and um, loved it. Had great friends. I got my That's dream That's where job. I live, by the way. I live in Charlotte. Really? Yeah. Do you really? Oh, oh wow. wow. I yeah. love, I loved Virginia. Yeah, so great. UVA, yeah. go who's. Yes, exactly. We can sing the fight song soon. Um, <laughs> but I loved Charlottesville and um, loved college, got really involved. And then I got my dream job in Boston. I wanted to live in Boston and I got a job there and um, loved it. And then when I decided I wanted to go back to grad school, I uh, applied to three schools. I got into them all, ended up going to Stanford where I met my husband. Um, he was a classmate, everything. Was, and then I got a great job after grad school. So I just thought this is the abundant life. I was so sure that my faithfulness is what gave me all those things, which is very frightening when I think about it now, but I was fairly um, prideful, I would say. And if people asked me about things, I think I, I was pretty sure I knew the answers that if you love God and you're faithful, then life is going to fall into place. And, mm -hmm. you know, I thought I was the perfect example of that. And that was sort of baked into my theology. And then things, things still were going well for a while. We had a child, Katie, and, and I had a, several miscarriages and that was my first feeling like, uh, I shouldn't be having miscarriages. I mean, I've, I've been faithful. Why, why is that happening? And then something a lot harder happened. And that's when I started wondering about the theology that I had really built the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. on. And what was that hard thing that happened? Well, my husband and I went in for a routine ultrasound for our second child. Um, I was 20 weeks pregnant and went in and found out that our son, our unborn son, had a hypoplastic left heart, which means he has half a heart. It's a rare condition. And if you don't operate, your child will die at birth. Hmm. And so the doctors said I had several options. One was do nothing and he would die. One was to have a heart transplant or one was to um, have a series of three surgeries that would, that would correct his heart problem, not completely, but he could live a fairly normal life with that. And it was hard. It was a hard decision. One, the medical community was not in favor of me even having him. Mm -hmm. So I had lots of pressure to have an abortion. And that was really hard because even people in my OB's office were asking me why I would even want to have this child. Hmm. And the heart surgery option where you did the three steps was a very viable option, but they still didn't think that was a good idea. So, so that, what, that was stressful. What did y'all decide to do? Well, we decided to do the three-step heart surgery and we got the best surgeon in the world who was in Michigan at university of Michigan delivered Paul and the surgery went beautifully. Hmm. I mean, it couldn't have gone better. We came home from the hospital after three weeks and Paul started gaining weight. At first it was hard because he couldn't nurse. He was, we fed him through an NG tube, which we had to put down his nose, which was terrifying. But after a few weeks, he was doing really well and so well that he was pretty much normal on the growth charts, height and weight, which is pretty unusual for a baby with a heart condition. And then we went in and took him in for his um, checkup when he was seven weeks old to the doctor and our doctor wasn't there. So our substitute doctor in North Carolina was there and he looked at Paul, our son, and said, he's great. He is like the best I've ever seen a heart baby. I don't think he needs all this medicine. So he said, he's over medicated. The fact that he's doing so well, just go home with this one or two prescription mm -hmm. refills. And I was thrilled. I remember calling people saying, he's just crossed over. He's doing great. And a friend of mine is a pediatric cardiologist. And I ended up, I was calling him that night. This was Friday night. And he said, that's crazy. He needs that heart medicine. Like that medicine is important for heart babies. And I said, what do I do? And he said, well, just wait till Monday and you need to go in Monday morning and get this fixed. 
And so I, I called the office and you know, there was the answering machine. And so I thought, okay, they'll call me back Monday. This will be fine. But Sunday night, um, Paul woke up in the middle of the night. He screamed and went limp in um, Dave's arms. And we went, called 911 and Dave went to the hospital with Paul. I stayed home with Katie and called some friends to come over. And while, they, while I was waiting, I called John, my friend, and I said, what do I do? And John said, this was 3 a.m., and he said, I'm so sorry. And I kept saying, John, like, what do I do? And all he could say was, I'm so sorry. And so I remember this moment. I got off the phone. I got on my knees, and I begged God. I bargained with God. I begged him. I said, I'll do anything. Just save my son. And so my friends came and I went to the hospital to see Paul, walked in and was really expecting that God was going to come through. I thought the doctors are going to be able to turn this around. But when I got there, I found out that our son had died. Mm -hmm. And that, that, was a huge blow in terms of, it just didn't make sense to me. We had gone through these hoops. We'd been faithful. We prayed, fasted, trusted God, gotten a good surgeon. And our son died because of a mistake. Mm. I think that was the hardest thing is, God, you could have prevented that. You could have done something and you didn't. And so for a really long time, I pulled, from, pulled away from God. But actually, I want to back up and say, at first, I was very, I accepted it. And um, my husband and I got up at Paul's funeral and said, God never makes a mistake. And so in in that time, I felt carried by God and felt like, okay, God is going to use this. God is going to fulfill his promises to me. But then I would say two days after the funeral, I just thought, why did I even say that? That's not how I feel. And I pulled far away from God, just thinking, I can't trust God. I begged God and he didn't answer me. And I was also embarrassed that I had said things in sort of this euphoria of walking with God that I didn't feel were true. And I was embarrassed by that. So that even pulled me out of community with people because mm -hmm. I just wanted to be left alone mm -hmm. and I didn't want questions. What do you mean the things that you had said in euphoria with God? Um, after Paul died, I feel like God really met me. So for those few days, I mm. felt like God was as real as he could be. And I felt that people were praying for us. I felt at his funeral that I felt strong to say those things that God never makes a mistake. And I was really, I really meant it at the time. And I was really felt feeling carried by God. But the reality of his death set in and oh. all of those things felt like they were just sort of pulled under the rug. Pulled, no, they felt like God had pulled the rug out from underneath me. Yeah. And that, that felt even more difficult because it felt like God had left me yeah. after he had carried me. And so I didn't know what to do or what to say about it. So what did those next few years look like for you or maybe months? I, I'm not sure what exactly happened, but I'm wondering how you responded to that, the feeling that God had left you and, yeah. that, well, and it, that this had happened because of someone's mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Both of those things were so hard and yet I knew that I couldn't keep running from God. So I remember being in the car. And just saying, God, I need you. Help me. And I pushed in um, just a worship tape. And all of a sudden, it felt like the presence of God filled my car. I remember turning off the music and just feeling like God was right there in the car. I don't think in my whole life I've ever felt that so strongly. And I started laughing when I was driving, just like, something had just rolled off of me and God was there. And I felt like I just started talking to God, like, this is incredible. And I was happier than I'd ever been in my life. And I thought, this is heaven. This is this sense of, it doesn't matter what's going on in my life, 
but somehow there is this taste of God that makes anything in my life okay. And that to this day is this sort of Ebenezer that I put in marker in my life that says, okay, I can have joy even in the worst of circumstances. And it wasn't really an explicable joy. It was just this sense that God is right here. God is going to carry me. God is going to walk me through it. And he did. And it was soon after that, that I um, heard a, a tape another cassette tape. This was years ago. I know. Um, I love the cassette tape references. I know. <laughs> that someone had given me um, that John Piper, a message that John Piper, who I'd never heard of before, had given at a conference, and it was called The Sovereignty of God and Suffering. And in that tape, he talks about the fact that God has ordained all of our suffering. And he quotes Charles Spurgeon, who was 57 and dying of gout and Bright's disease, and someone t- said to Spurgeon, how can you stand it knowing God has allowed this in your life? And Spurgeon said, allowed it? If I didn't think that God had ordained it, I wouldn't be able to stand it. I, Spurgeon basically said, if God had not measured my suffering to the very ounce, I wouldn't be able to stand it. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, wow, Spurgeon really believes that it's measured to the ounce. So if I believe it's measured to the ounce, then God is in this and I don't understand it. I'm not saying that I'm happy about it, but yet at the same time, I know that God has purpose in it and he's going to use it. Hmm. And so that was a radical shift in my theology that happened really soon after this joy in God. And I don't think if I had had the joy in God, I would have had a framework to even understand that, but I had understood that I could have joy in the worst of sorrow. And so then kind of putting the pieces together that when God promises us never to leave us and promises us an abundant life, that abundant life isn't because our circumstances are good. It's because God is good in them to us. Mm -hmm. And so that began this radical shift for me from God promises me or owes me a good life to God. God promises me himself and he Mm. always gives me that. That's good. I'm wondering about your husband though, because what I've found is when my husband and I have experienced suffering, we have really come at it in two different ways. We handle it very differently. So I'm wondering, was your husband was, first of all, was he a believer? And also how was he coming to these same conclusions or was that causing some difficulty as you were grieving together or separately? Yes. Um, I think he, at the time, his theology was probably stronger than mine. And I think he, as a result though, he saw that God was in it probably the whole time after the funeral and after that. So we were a little bit distant because I couldn't maintain that closeness to God. And I think he just saw it as, okay, God gives and he takes away, you know, let's praise God through this. And I wasn't there. And so I think I felt very much like the weaker person. You know, I was the one that was questioning God and drawing, pulling away from God, but it was a really good thing when I listened to that Piper tape and then I had him listen to it. And he said, wow, this is, this is true. And so that brought us both on this journey Mm -hmm. of, of serving God and seeing that all of our lives sort of reframing our lives and our own suffering to see that God is sovereign and Mm -hmm. God is using it. So I think ultimately it drew us together, but at first it pulled us apart because we grieved so differently I wanted to process and talk about it with him. And he didn't really, he wasn't as interested in doing that for as long as I was. Mm -hmm. So there was this, seems like a big change in, in your life, in the way you thought about the perfect Christian life that you thought you were building and what God's purposes were for you, um, that he was going to use the suffering in your life. Did you see that? coming to fruition, were you able to do feel like God gave you purpose through Paul's death? 
Yeah, he did. He showed me in so many different ways. Um, one thing that was pretty incredible is um, this woman from our church came over and I remember telling her all that God had done. And she called me probably a month later and said, I wrote a song about your son. And I was wondering if it's okay if I send you the words and we're going to sing it. At, I've had somebody else and we're going to sing it at church in a few weeks. And I thought, okay, wow. <laughs> and so she did. And it was an amazing song. And then um, Natalie Grant ended up picking up that song. My friend is a singer songwriter and that song is held. H -E -L -D. Oh my gosh, I love that song. Yeah. So that was written about Paul because it says two months is too little, but they let him go. They had no sudden healing. And that, you know, to think that Providence would um, take a child from his mother while she prays is appalling. And so all of those words were the ones that I had said to her, you know, this is how I feel. Wow. And so that was pretty incredible because that song was released in 2006. So it was, it was quite a number of years after Paul died, but saw this huge purpose in it later. It's just like, wow, God really used that song to minister to people. Well, I have to, and, I like super have chills right now because I have to tell you when my son was three, we got some really difficult news and that was 2006. Oh, wow. And that song was the song that God used in my life to help me to process what was happening and to, to think about it. And John 9 was a really important passage for me. But that song was kind of the theme of that year for me as we were grieving. Really? Yes. Wow. That's crazy. Oh, word. I know. That's so crazy. I love that song. It yeah, a, it's incredible. A lot of meaning for me. I, I, for anybody listening, I'll put a link to that in the show notes just in case you haven't heard it. But wow, that's incredible. Um, yeah. well, well, can we move ahead to, because things happen in your marriage too. Did right. I, yeah. Can you tell yeah. us? So I'll, um, well, I'll go quickly through what happened. So six years after Paul died, I was diagnosed with post-polio syndrome, which is basically all your muscles in your body start failing. And so you go backwards and you can eventually be where you were when you first got polio. Oh, wow. So even though I had muscle transfers, a lot of my gains and my ability to walk was because of exercise. So I exercise like three times a day for most of my life. Wow. And when I, in 2003, I was diagnosed with post-polio. And so they basically told me I needed to stop doing everything that I did. I used to be an artist. I scrapbooked. I love to cook, do all of those things. And the doctor said, if you don't stop in 10 years, somebody's going to be brushing your teeth. So that's what I deal with even now today is the effects of this post-polio. So I will probably end up in a wheelchair. I can't use my arms very much anymore. So you know, you'd asked me at the beginning about what that looked like. And so for a long time, it looked like nothing. Um, I got all this strength and I was just going to have this really straight line, normal life physically, but I have um, been going downhill pretty rapidly. So there's, I can't be alone. I can't, I can drive, but I can't, I have adjust ad adaptations to drive. Um, and eventually I may be a quadriplegic. So just understanding that was a huge huge thing for me, just realizing this life that I thought I had built um, was falling apart and continues to, but God really met me. And I mean, that was a time when, you know, my husband was really supportive and we just tried to figure it out. Although it was pretty hard for him realizing that he had married somebody that was one way and then, and then all of a sudden it, it was looking very different, but it was, it was a good thing for us to go through together. And I thought our marriage was really strong, which is why we'd been through a lot together post-polio. Mm -hmm. We've been through our son's death. And so I really thought things were fine with us, but he took a job out of state and was traveling back and forth and just started getting really distant. And I thought it was because we were traveling. He was traveling and said, you know, maybe we need to move because we were planning on moving, but he had decided that it would be better for our family to wait. 
And I said, I think we need to move. Like we're drifting. And he said no still, but then he came home and told me he had found somebody else Ooh. from his, um, and he left and moved away to another state. And I had two adolescent daughters that we were raising. They were nine and 12 at the time, almost 13. And my world fell apart. I was homeschooling them. I had all these physical issues that I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. And that truly was the hardest time of my whole life because I, I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't know how I was going to function. And I did feel just so lost even with the Lord, because I, I just didn't even have categories for how hard life became for a while. Just physically trying to get the girls places because they didn't drive and yeah. homeschooling and uh, just terrified. Finances. Yeah. I'd never paid bills before, even though, you know, I actually have a degree in finance, but ever since we'd been married, I, I didn't even know where the bills were or how to pay them or how to do any of that. So it just, it, I spiraled down quickly. I remember staying in bed for uh, a week straight, lost 10 pounds in a month and just didn't know what to do. And I remember just lying in bed screaming, God, why do you hate me? Like I just decided God must hate me that all of this would happen. Well, how do you, I just, at this point in your life, I'm thinking a doctor's mistake took your child's life. Your husband has made this decision. Like, I think I would feel so bitter Yeah. toward specific people. Yeah. I, I just would love for you to speak to that because I, I, some people listening, they may not have experienced exactly what you have, but we all deal with bitterness in some way. And sometimes it yeah. just takes root and it, and it grows so quickly and we don't know how to respond to it. So I'm yeah. sure you have some wisdom to offer us. Well, it was funny. I, um, so many layers of bitterness. Uh, one layer was my, um, my husband at the time. I was so angry at him and just couldn't believe that he would do that to me. So I was bitter towards him, but I, a lot of what I did is put it on this other woman. So I felt um, like, oh, yeah. okay. So my husband wouldn't have done this to me. This was her. She pulled him away. And so I pretty much hated her. And so this hate was just growing inside of me and just had really horrible fantasies that something horrible was going to happen to her. And then I was reading Francis Chan's book, Crazy Love. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read it, wow. but he has this quote in there from Frederick Buechner, who talks about what God's love is. And I wish I had it here, but um, it's an unbelievable quote. And it talks about basically that our love for other, you know, for people who are less privileged than us, you know, that's a noble love. But then he says at the end, the love for the tortured love for the torturer, this is God's love and it changes the world. And I remember thinking, Oh, that sounds really beautiful. And then all of a sudden I had this sense that God was saying, I'm talking to you. And I threw that book against the wall. Mm. I was so scared. Like, what are you saying to me, God? Like, what are you wanting me to do? And so I decided that wasn't for me. I don't know if you ever push aside things like that, but I just uh -huh. thought I'm not doing anything with this. Yeah. So I got in bed like that night and I just thought, no, this is not me. And I could not sleep and I could not sleep and I could not sleep. And then all these words started coming through my head. So I got up and I sensed God wanted me to write a letter to this other woman that my husband was seeing. And so I typed it all night, just got up, wrote it, just saying, I don't know why I'm writing you this letter, but I want to share with you the gospel. And I want to just offer you what, what, you know, that God, there's forgiveness and there's grace in Christ. And I didn't want to send it, but I did it. And I thought, okay, after I sent it, I thought, you know what? One, I thought two things. I thought, I'm a pretty cool person. And then <laughs> I, thought, I thought, God is going to use this to bring him back. I was so sure of that. Oh. And God is going to bring her to Christ. So I had these three things that God was going to do. One, he was going to think I was pretty awesome. And then he was going to think about these things. And so I waited and waited for these other things to come through. And they didn't. 
So my um, my ex-husband um, said, yeah, she got the, the letter and I sent a CD with it. She got that. Is there anything you want her to do? And I was like, no, I, I thought that was going to change your life, but apparently it didn't. <laughs> and yeah. she didn't, you know, they, they didn't break up. And then I remember just going to God, like, why, why did I do that? And I sense God was like, you did that for you. And it was true. Like it changed me because I had started praying for her, for her as she read the letter and how she would respond and that God would change her heart and God would bring her to Christ. And in praying for her, God had changed me. Hmm. And I realized I had let go of a lot of that bitterness. And that was pretty remarkable to me that I wasn't constantly hoping something bad would happen to her. You know, there was that joke, you know, I pray for her. I pray she hits, gets hit by a truck or something like that. And I was not <laughs> praying that way. So I felt like that was God really changing me. And the other thing I had done is I prayed every day, God, don't let me be bitter because I knew a lot of people who had gone through something like that where they were deeply wounded and it's written on their face. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that. I didn't want the already the injury to me to be compounded by bitterness that would steal my own joy in my own life. And I think that's the way God brought that about for me was just releasing it because I wanted to pray for her and I wanted to write this letter and it really changed bitterness for me. What about bitterness toward God? Did you deal um, with that yeah. or no? Yeah. Well, I was lying in bed saying, God, why do you hate me? Well, and Yeah. <laughs> That's so bitterness. that's pretty bitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, but the amazing thing from that was I just kept talking to God. So I would, I remember opening the Bible and finding really the hardest things that people said to God, like you can find some pretty serious things mm -hmm. and lamentations and Job and Psalms. And I would pray them and say them and journal them and say, God, where are you? Why do you hate me? You know, how long, oh Lord? And the crazy thing was I would do that day after day. And yet in my journal, I would come around to seeing God in that. And that's really how I think we're designed when we look at Psalms and Lamentations and Job, people, as they pour out their bitterness to God, but talk to him, mm -hmm. he brings them back. And I found that it was only like, the situation after my son died, when I refused to talk to God, that that's when the bitterness stayed. But when I was willing to be straight with God and say, this is how I'm feeling, then God used that and took it and turned it around for me. Hmm. That's really good. Cause that's something it's hard to do when we're going through something that's really painful, but it's something we each have access to just praying that God would. Yeah take her bitterness and turn it into joy. So what are some ways that God provided for you in those years where you were a single mom raising teenage girls? Mm. He provided great friends, people who came alongside of me. And it was always helpful when people would just stop by and say, Hey, can I do anything to help you today? I mean, mm. part of it was just groceries and getting gas in my car. Cause with post polio, my and my, um, my husband was doing all that. And so all yeah. of a sudden I had to do everything and friends were great and helping and just a bunch of friends got together and would pray for me, pray with me. And often somebody would come by and just say, how can I help? So that was wonderful. And God really met me. I would say that was when my faith became much stronger. I feel like I had a strong faith through all of those other things, but I didn't know what it was like to really experience God every morning. I felt like there were times when my quiet time was like, oh, I got to do this. And after that happened with Dave leaving, my quiet times were nothing but God just pouring into me in a way that I had never experienced on a continual basis. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like what I had experienced that day in the car after Paul died on a different level, but scripture just got opened it up to me. And so it, it really did change me so that my walk with God is so much deeper than it ever was before. And he would just show me things in scripture almost every day. Like I didn't know where to get wisdom because you know, when you're a single parent, there's a lot of decisions that you have no idea what, how to 
walk through that. And my kids became teenagers, both rebelled, walked away from God. I didn't know what to do. And it was really God just telling me what to do. It sounds crazy, but like every day I would open the Bible with an expectation, like, God, you have got to show me something today. And I don't think when I'm not struggling, I do that with the Bible. I think of it as something nice to know. Whereas when I was in that much pain, it was like, you have to renew me, refresh me, teach me, show me. You have to be everything to me. And I'm opening the Bible, like do it. And he did it every day. <laughs> like it's, I mean, I really cannot even explain how much he just did it. Like yeah. I took him at his word and I said, God, you promised to be the father to the fatherless, the husband to the widow. And I feel like I'm kind of like a widow here. Be my husband, be my kid's father, show me what to do. Wow. When you say the scars that have shaped me, you truly have been formed into the image of Christ, specifically through the suffering you've experienced. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's why, you know, at the beginning, we talked about why I say I'm a sufferer, because that's really my story. That's, yeah. that's, but God has shown me the beauty of the word, how much I love being with him, just changed my character from a pretty arrogant, I've got it all together person to somebody who really depends on him a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful for all of those yeah. things. Well, and you ended up meeting somebody. Yes, I did. I met an amazing guy. Um, I've been married almost five years. It'd be five years in February. Um, and his name is Joel, which is neat because, you know, Joel says, um, Joel's 225 says, I will restore the years the locust has eaten. And God really has done that in him. He's amazing. And um, yeah, so I'm so thankful for him and all that God has brought me through him. And are your girls doing okay? Yeah, they both um, came back to faith, which is really Great. pretty amazing. One of them, the older one was in Senegal, West Africa for a year doing missions um, after she graduated from college. And the younger one is a senior at Wheaton and um, just both walking with the Lord, That's which great. is, and, and we are not promised that. So I'm not saying, oh, because I was faithful, God right. did that, but it was an amazing gift for me. And I think they both would say that their faith is stronger because they had to rely on God themselves when their life looked horrible. I mean, my ex-husband was really involved in the church and I really do feel like he's a believer. And so to have all of that happen and, and just feel like we were the perfect Christian little family, I was teaching Bible study and to have that happen and walk away and then find God is sufficient really yeah. changes you. Yeah. Well, one last question. You connected, at some point in our conversation, you connected suffering with joy, and you said they really go hand in hand. Yeah. Can you help us understand that? How, have, how has God cultivated joy in your life, specifically through the suffering? Yeah, I think our capacity for joy is carved out of the amount of suffering we have. That's just this theory I have, and I think <laughs> that the people, whenever you suffer a lot and you have loss, there's this, this hole in your life. And I feel like God fills that with himself. And I think God is joy. You know, I mean, Psalm 16 says, in your presence is fullness of joy. And I think God gives us his presence in suffering in a way that we don't have at other times. I mean, God is with us all the time, you know, so I'm not saying that God is only with us when we suffer, but... I think there are times in our lives when we sense God is right there and there are times that we are searching for God, but we, we don't feel he's there, even though God doesn't move, but our own hearts do. And I think in suffering, there's this unique gift of the veil being really thin. And we, we kind of like Moses behold God with unveiled faces, hmm. whereas often the veil is there and we kind of know he's there, but we don't really see him quite the same way. Hmm. And I think that's the biggest joy in suffering is beholding God with an unveiled face. That's so, I love that idea of the whole, the suffering creates this hole that God fills with himself. I've experienced that. I, I love hearing how he's done that in your life. And it's such an encouragement to hear your story and where you are and how God's using your story. Now you're writing about it and he, he has used you for his glory. I love it. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing what God does. I would never have expected my life to turn out the way it's planned, and I wouldn't have written it this way if somebody asked me how to write it, but 
now that he's written it, you know, up until my age now, um, I wouldn't change it. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. You'll definitely want to click the link in the show notes to the song Held by Natalie Grant that Benita and I talked about today. I went back and listened to that song after talking with Benita, and wow, knowing the story behind it makes it even more special to me than it was before. Join me, friends, next week as I speak with Lily Park. Lily is an assistant professor at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. In our conversation, Lily talks about how she ended up in seminary as a student and then in her current job. She also talks about the challenges she's faced as a woman in academic leadership at seminary and what kinds of conversations she's consistently having with female students who are pursuing seminary education. Then we talked about fear. Lily talks about how she has faced down fear fear in her work and how she's faced down fears regarding her future. We also get into a whole wonderful conversation about singleness. So friends, there is a lot you will want to hear in our conversation next week. Until then, have a great week and keep walking forward by faith.